literally in a room by myself. Uh, but uh, I appreciate the offer to come down, Kate, and um, and talk about skunks again. Um, All right. I, uh, I I I think that probably the best place to start uh, is how I became interested in skunks. Um, so when I started grad school, I went to grad school at UC Davis uh, and uh, in the ecology program. And my major professor, when I first met him, he said, uh, oh my gosh, I have this fantastic project on jaguars in Belize, if you're interested in, in doing something with jaguars. And I, of course, was like, yeah, totally. I'm in 100%. And so I enrolled at Davis. I, and then when I showed up on campus, my first meeting with him, he said, the Jaguar project fell through. How do you feel about skunks? And it was kind of a letdown initially, because I thought, I don't feel anything about skunks. Um, but the more I sort of wove my way through sort of the carnivore guild and worked my way down to skunks, the more I realized that they're just this incredible species, or group of species, really. Um, and they are just this amazing example of how elegant evolution is and how these species, these little guys that live in these dangerous places, come up with all these different adaptations to help them survive. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about basic skunk ecology and taxonomy. Um, and then I'm going to get into the meat of my talk, which is really the stuff that I'm interested in, which is interspecific signaling. So that's how species communicate with other species. Um, so I'll just start, oops, it's gonna work here. Um, so skunks are in the taxonomic order carnivora. So we know a lot of species that belong to this order, felids, canids, bears, you have your seals and sea lions. Um, and then down here at the bottom, um, we have the suborder um, Mesteloidea. Uh, and this is where a bunch of these little species live. So um, skunks, were, have historically been considered um, mustelids, which are weasels and badgers and things like that. Uh, but there was some work done in the late 90s uh, that determined that actually skunks are their own taxonomic family. Weasels are more closely related to the procyonids, which are the raccoons. Uh, and so there are 13 species in the family Mephididae. So all of these guys have black and white coloration. All of these guys have noxious anal secretions. Um, and all of them, most of them live in the New World. Uh, these two at the top, these little funny looking things are called stink badgers. And they live in Sumatra, Indonesia, Java. Um, they're little guys, they weigh about five and a half pounds. They live in the rainforest and things. They're, they're sort of hard to see, I guess. Um, and they're most commonly seen by people as roadkill, uh, which is often how we experience uh, mephitids. Uh, in California, uh, we have two species. So we have the striped skunk that we're all probably most familiar with. We also have this little guy here, which is called the Western Spotted Skunk. Uh, and these guys live all over the West Coast or uh, into the Midwest where they uh, overlap a little bit with another species called the Eastern Spotted Skunk. Um, they're generally pretty hard to see though. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, so just kind of the basic biology. So we have um, our striped skunk, which is the one that we all see all of the time. Uh, and they're, they can be quite large. And they max out about 11 and a half pounds. Um, and unfortunately, we don't know a ton about the ecology of skunks because believe it or not, they're kind of hard to study. Uh, there isn't a huge group of people that want to wade into this whole world. Um, and so a lot of the information we have about striped skunks comes from a very few studies that were done in the Midwest or, um, or, or Canada. And so there's, there's uh, groups of animals, populations that were studied in places that have like really um, snowy winters and things like that. So the, the, their climate is really, really variable. And so as a result, um, some of the statistics and the information I'm gonna share with you about striped skunks <laughs> It's probably different here because we have this kind of more temperate climate. We don't have the severe winters. A lot of the um, uh, lifespan and things like that are probably greater here. Um, so um, by comparison, the spotted skunk is about the size of a ground squirrel. They max out at about a pound and a half. Um, both species are omnivorous, which means they kind of eat whatever they can get their hands on. 
uh, snakes, lizards, eggs, they'll eat carrion, um, they'll try to catch small mammals, things like that. They don't have the greatest eyesight, their sense of smell is kind of what drives their foraging behavior. Um, and they're both habitat generalists, so they're found in just about everywhere. So agricultural fields, they're found in urban areas, suburban areas. Um, spotted skunks tend to be a bit more arboreal than striped skunks. Uh, and we don't really know much about predation on skunks. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and they, so they're, they breed, striped skunks breed in the early spring. Spotted skunks breed in the fall, but they have this funny system of delayed implantation. So they breed in September, but the babies aren't born until May. So the, um, the blastocyst kind of floats around in the female for like six, seven months, and then it implants. And so once implantation happens, gestation's only 30 days. And so it's also um, worth noting uh, that spotted skunks live at pretty low density. And so when males go looking for mates, it's kind of hard work. And so uh, when in, there was a study, randomly one of the few things we know about spotted skunks is the size of their testicles. Um, and so there was a study that was done that found in January, February, um, the male spotted skunks testicles uh, are quite small, but they almost uh, triple in size. Uh, by the fall. So, and the, there's a corresponding testosterone burst that happens here too. So uh, this is 0.15 nanograms per milliliter is how much testosterone is in the testicles of the male spotted skunk in January. And it rises to 6.4 nanograms per milliliter in um, early October. So they're out there doing their thing as much as they can with whoever they can find. Um, typically, uh, they, striped skunks have two to 12 babies in a litter. Spotted skunks have two to five. We don't know anything about spotted skunk babies and how they develop and when they can spray and things like that. Um, striped skunks can spray at eight days, but they can't really aim. So uh, it takes about a month, month and a half before they can really direct their spray. Um, but be careful because they can spray in, in a week. Uh, striped skunks hit sexual, mat sexual maturity in 10 months, spotted skunks less than a year probably, but we don't really know. Uh, it is worth mentioning that baby skunks are fantastic. Uh, they're extremely cute and they actually have their coloration when they're born. So you can, you can tell the pattern that the skunk's uh, fur is going to have uh, from birth. And so this lifespan uh, number here, so striped skunks live typically only one to two years, most less than a year. Again, that's from areas where there's a really, really harsh winter. Uh, and so that it's a bit more taxing for these guys, particularly because striped skunk populations aren't controlled by predation, they're controlled by disease. And so in places where there's a really harsh winter, these guys will den communally. So they all get together, they sleep in a big cuddle puddle, uh, and essentially, it just creates a really great opportunity for disease to move through populations. And so um, that's probably, in California, I would imagine that this is longer, but we don't, we don't really know. Um, so living in, with skunks can be a challenge. Um, this dog has been bathed in tomato juice after being sprayed, um, which is not a thing. Um, I realize this is what everybody is told to do or has been told to do. This causes something that's called olfactory exhaustion, where your whole nasal system basically shuts down because um, it's just overstimulated. Um, and I'm going to show you this video. It's kind of long. It's like a minute and 40 seconds long. Um, but it's a kind of a good demonstration of how reluctant skunks are to spray. Um, and so I don't know what's wrong with the guy that's filming this. And, He's just putting his dog out to get sprayed here. But um, so you can see the skunk is willing to take a lot of abuse. Um, so that tail up is kind of their first signal that they're unhappy. And it just, you know, it could spray this dog right now and deal with this whole situation, but they really don't want to spray for the most part. So I'm just going to kind of 
push it forward a little bit. And so that's the point where the skunk sprayed the dog. The dog is unhappy. <laughs> and then um, this is typically what happens, rubbing the face on them. We probably all know how this story ends. Um, and then the skunk is still just standing there because in theory, message has been received. Although dogs, I think we can all agree, um, make some bad decisions. Uh, and so being sprayed by a skunk may not have the same impact on a dog that it might have on a wild predator. So, but anyway, um, skunks do do some things for us. So they're great at rodent control. They're great at insect pest control, particularly in agricultural areas. Um, and they're super cute. So, I mean, I think that stands alone. Um, and then uh, the cons are this nuisance spraying issue, which I'm sure you can imagine when you give talks about skunks, how many people um, have had negative experiences with skunks in one way or another. I realize that that's, there are a lot of us out there who have experienced nuisance spraying in one way or another. Um, and then I also have this infectious disease transmission. Um, and I have all of these diseases labeled here, um, not to be dramatic, but basically to show that it runs the gamut from bacterial infections, viral infections, parasites, fungal infections, things like that. So these guys are real reservoirs of disease. Um, but again, that may be of, uh, uh, due to the fact that most of what we know about skunks and disease come from these very few studies. Uh, so the thing that I'm most interested in with respect to skunks is how they use their coloration to communicate with other species. And so that's, uh, so that there, so there are two types of visual communication. So there's intraspecific communication, which is communication between individuals of the same species. So for example, a bull um, elk may use his big rack and his big body size to communicate his fitness to a female elk. But there's also interspecific communication, and this is a lot trickier. So this is an animal using some kind of visual cue to communicate with members of another species. And so that same elk might use that same rack and that same large body size to communicate to a pack of wolves that it's unwise to chase him and try to attack him because he's so big. And so um, this is kind of the thing that I'm most interested in. And so you can kind of think about these types of communication, or in some cases, as what are called signals of unprofitability. And so unprofitability is sort of an overly complicated word, but it means the same thing in this circumstance that does like in business. So if something's unprofitable, there's no net gain. It's more costly. So these animals are basically trying to advertise to their predators that it's more costly for that predator to chase them, to catch them, to subdue them and to kill them, then that predator will get in terms of energy from eating their bodies. And you know, are animals making these decisions consciously? Probably not. But, but these are all evolutionary behaviors and traits uh, that have worked toward that same goal of essentially advertising to a potential predator to avoid them. And so these signals take a bunch of different forms. Um, the ones we're kind of most familiar with are these signals, for example, that prey are difficult to catch. And so the, the critter in the top circle here is called a greater kudu, um, and they live in um, so southern Africa, East Africa, and they have this white bar between their eyes. And essentially what they do when they see a predator is they stare it down. And so a predator knows that if they see that white bar, that the jig is up and they've been spotted and it may not be worth it to them to try to pursue this animal. The little guy in the bottom is a Thompson's gazelle um, and they do this thing, which I'm sure we've all seen on nature shows called stoding or stoding. Um, and essentially what they do is they just spring straight up in the air, all four feet off the ground at the same time in this really exaggerated leap. And it looks ridiculous. And if you were trying to escape from a cheetah or a lion, it seems maybe like not a super smart move because you, they're moving more slowly than they would be if they just ran straight out. Um, but what this behavior does is it tells a predator, look at how strong I am. Um, look at how unconcerned I am about you. Like I can waste my time and my energy making these exaggerated jumps because I know I can beat you in a race. Um, and so, and there was a study that was done in Tanzania in, I guess it was the late 90s, um, where researchers actually looked at this and they found that cheetahs almost never pursued Thompson's gazelle that's stoated. 
And when they did pursue them, they rarely caught them. Um, there are also signals that prey are noxious in some way. So the picture on the top is a poisonous frog from the Congo. In the bottom, this is called a streaked tenric, which are found in Madagascar. Um, they have a toxin in their skin and they're covered in these yellow and black spines. Um, they're little insectivores. They're like giant shrews. They're very cool. Um, and then we also have signals that, uh, that the prey is dangerous. So this guy in the, in the top here, um, that is the wily and elusive honey badger. Um, this is called an African crested porcupine here. So honey badgers don't, they have anal secretions, but they don't really spray them at predators. Um, they have what, what's called hyperaggression. So they will attack um, animals much, much bigger than themselves. They, there are all these, I don't know if these are actually true, but um, I've heard that they'll attack car tires and things like that. Um, they're super, super aggressive. And then these guys have these quills that they erect if they're threatened by a predator. Um, you know, porcupines don't shoot their quills. These guys don't have barbs on the end of the quills like the North American porcupines do, um, but they'll, they'll erect these quills and kind of rattle them, excuse me, um, to make a sound uh, to kind of, to, uh, to, to discourage predators. And so the, the creatures that I'm most, interesting, most interested in are these guys here who have this warning coloration. And so warning coloration is found in all kinds of taxa. It's found in insects, it's found in um, reptiles, it's found in mammals, it's found in birds. Um, and it's, it basically functions in some way to warn a potential predator away from eating these guys. Um, and so skunks fit into this category, right? We know that skunks are black and white. They're one of the very few black and white animals that we see here on the landscape. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works in their favor. So there are lots of black and white colored carnivores. So there was a study that was done in the, um, I think it was 94, where they found that black and white coloration has evolved at least four times in the order carnivora, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot. Um, so these are two guys. So these are both mustelids. This is a European badger on the left and an American badger on the right. Um, they both have their black and white coloration on their faces. And um, part of the reason behind that is that they're fossorial animals. So they live underground. And so when a predator encounters them, nine times out of 10, um, if the badger retreats underground and comes back to kind of defend itself, the predator is gonna see that coloration on their faces. Um, these guys, are also both mustelids, but they're found in different parts of the world. So this is a grisson from South America, which is like a giant weasel. Um, and this is our honey badger again. So they look really, really similar, but um, these guys are found in Chile and Argentina. Um, these guys are found in all over Africa. And then we have these guys. So this is our spotted skunk. So this is again in the family Mephididae. These are both mustelids. So this is a Libyan striped weasel that lives in Libya. Um, and this is a Zorillo that lives in West Africa. And you can see how similarly they're colored. So this is like an amazing example of convergent evolution where you have these animals that aren't particularly closely related to one another, all developing this suite of traits that's almost identical, down to the Zorilla's um, white patches above its eyes and between its, between its eyes there, Look how similar that is. We also have um, other species of tenric in Madagascar that are black and white. Here's, here's our porcupine again. And then we have, this is the stink badger, which looks like a cartoon. Um, and then this goofy thing is not a carnivore, uh, but it's, a, it's like a, a runner-up prize. Uh, this is called a maned rat. Um, and they have hollow um, hairs, and they anoint themselves with the bark of a tree that's toxic. And so when animals try to attack them and they get a mouthful of this liquefied saliva filled tree bark, um, they can get quite ill and die. So what do these guys all have in common? They're black and white. And so why? Why is black and white the thing? We have snakes that are black and red. We've got insects that are black and yellow. Why black and white? Um, and so this is one of the things that I, this is how I, this was my entry point into the world of skunks. Um, so this graph here is from a project that I did when I was in grad school. And essentially what I did is I looked at all of the carnivore species 
or uh, in the Americas. And I looked at the number of predators they had. I looked at the type of habitats they used. I looked at the type of food that they ate and the time of day that they were active. And so I kind of added all that together and came up with like a worst case predator problem. So animals that overlap in time and space with, with a lot of predators. And so what I found is that the animals that are contrastingly colored overlap with way more predators than animals that aren't contrastingly colored. So these guys are potentially really, really vulnerable to predation. They also have, so skunks have um, what's called a plantigrade foot posture. So dogs and cats, uh, if you look at your dog's foot or your cat's foot, you'll see that they have this kind of heel that's up kind of partway up their arm. So they walk on their toes. Um, and skunks walk on their flat feet like a bear. And so the problem with walking flat-footed is that you're slower. It's just more foot um, surface area to get off the ground every time you take a step. And so not only are these guys overlapping in space and time with a lot of predators, they're physiologically and morphologically kind of at a disadvantage. And so when you think about the types of predators that these guys face, um, you have raptors, you've got birds of prey, um, you have um, procyonids like raccoons, which I don't know if raccoons eat skunks, but they're bigger than them in body size. Um, you've got canids like foxes and coyotes. You've got ursids, which are the bears, and then you have the felids like bobcats and mountain lions. And so when you think about the totality of this, this pool of potential predators, and you think about um, how those predators experience the world. So these are all species that have different visual systems, right? So, um, so raccoons are one of the few species that's actually kind of, they see monochromatically. So they really only see in blacks and whites and, and grayscale. Um, there, I've read some papers that think that cats can see red from time to time, but by and large, these guys all see the world in yellows and blues. Um, and so when you're a skunk and you're trying to communicate with all of these different species, birds, of course, have this amazing color vision, generally. Um, uh, and so when you're, when you're a skunk and you're trying to communicate all the, to all of these species that they should avoid you, you need to have a visual signal that all of these animals are equally able to see. Um, and so we have, so they're just quick uh, vision 101. Um, so we have two types of photoreceptors in our eyes. We have rods and we have cones. So cones are responsible for color vision. Rods are, are really great at, at determining movement um, and things like that. So, um, so rods, cones don't work at night. So if you're living in a low light environment, um, it's, it's better to exploit that rod-based scotopic vision um, than to try to exploit color vision. And so if you think about all of those animals that I named, these guys, they're all nocturnal and skunks are nocturnal. And so that black and, black and white coloration is gonna both be really, really um, uh, obvious to all of those different species given their visual system. It's also gonna be doubly obvious because these guys are operating at night. And so it's about color and it's about contrast. So these guys aren't black and red because if they were black and red, when the light levels dropped, that black and red would be almost indistinguishable to most of those species, if that makes sense. So these guys are called um, aposomatic, which is an overly complicated way to say um, warning coloration. So these are conspicuous contrasting colorations that serve to inform a potential predator that it's unwise to attack because the prey is defended or dangerous. Um, and so here's our badger again with the black and white coloration on its face. Um, this is a bird called a pichahui that lives in New Guinea, and they're one of the very few toxic birds. Um, they actually have a toxin in their feathers and in their skin um, that can be, that can kill an animal that tries to eat it. And so when you're thinking about all of these things and thinking about how these animals communicate with one another, it's important to think about how these animals come in contact with one another. And so what happens when a predator hunts? So there's this whole sequence of activities that has to take place before a bobcat can catch a hare, okay? So first it has to see the prey and it has to identify what it is. And it has to decide if, I, if it wants to approach that prey or not. So it's gotta approach it. And then once it approaches it, it's gotta decide if it's gonna pursue that prey or not. 
If it chooses to pursue that prey, it's got to catch it, it's got to kill it, and then it, it eats it, okay? And so if you have warning coloration like a skunk, um, so as these, so this, this is like a whole process, right? There are all these decisions that a bobcat has to make before it decides it wants to chase something. And so, and as an animal moves through that process, sort of the further it gets to that process, the less likely it is to change its mind. So if a bobcat decides it's gonna chase that hare, it's gonna chase it until it catches it or the hare gets away. It's not gonna get, you know, two seconds into a chase and be like, yeah, change my mind, I don't wanna do it anymore. Um, and so it's in the interest of, of the prey species to, to interrupt that species as, as quickly as possible. So if a bobcat's going after a skunk, it's got to see it and identify it. And this is the place where it decides, no, I don't want to do it. And so this, there are certain attributes that the warning coloration has to have in order to be really, really useful against all of these different types of predators. And so there are certain qualities that these signals have to have. So the first is that it has to be detectable. So it has to be sufficiently different than the background vegetation, than um, the environment in which it's living so that it can be seen at a distance um, by its potential predators. And so skunks and a lot of these species that I've shown you so far have something that's called reverse counter shading. So most animals are, have counter shading, which means that they're darker on the top than they are underneath. And what that does is it helps to break up the body shape and it makes it harder for a predator to sort of pick out the animal as it's moving from shadows into light and back into shadows and things like that. So reverse counter shading does the opposite. It actually makes these guys easier to see than they otherwise would be. It also makes them um, appear larger and more obvious in their um, environment than if they were just all black or all white. So it also has to be discriminable. So that means just that it's sufficiently different from everything else around it that there aren't recognition errors, that a bobcat doesn't see a skunk and mistake it for a fox. And then finally, uh, the signal has to be memorable. So um, there's been a lot of research that's shown that animals that attack um, aposematic or warning colored prey are less likely to attack that type of prey in the future. And the classic example of that is the study that was done um, on blue jays. And these researchers fed blue jays, naive blue jays, monarch butterflies, which are of course toxic. Um, and the blue jays were all happy to eat them the first time around, but then wouldn't eat them again, even when they were deprived of food. And so if you think about where we are um, and California's food web, you have sort of your primary producers, your grasses and your trees that generate all of this food for all these grazers, rabbits and squirrels and deer and all those type of guys to eat. And then you have all of the predators, right? And so all of the, pre the predators eat the prey species and then the mid-sized predators are eaten by the larger predators. Um, but then there's this situation where people, people, well, some people eat skunks, surely, but um, <laughs> animals don't tend to eat skunks. So um, there aren't a ton of studies on skunks, which I think I've said several times uh, now, but um, the studies that have been done have not found a significant um, amount of predator-based mortality. And, you know, given that we're working with a small group of studies, you know, it's, it's possible that they've missed something. But then there's the contemporary data that's coming out now basically reinforces this. So here is a study that was done um, looking at how skunks responded to coyote howls and coyote urine. And so um, the researchers uh, played coyote howls at like a ridiculous rate. It was like, um, I think it was, it was, they played, they played the coyote howl for a minute, one minute every hour, every day for a week. So if you're a skunk, you think there are an awful lot of coyotes living in your neighborhood. Um, and what they found is that the skunks did not change their behavior significantly um, with all of this howling that was happening. And the researchers also sprayed coyote urine all over the place. And they found that the skunks didn't really change their behavior with response to coyote urine. And to the point where as the howling was happening, the skunks are still milling around within 50 meters, 100 meters, 200 meters of the speaker that's playing this, these coyote sounds. So clearly they're not particularly concerned about being killed by a coyote. 
And then this, we always hear about skunks and owls, skunks and owls, great horn owls, always with the owls. Um, and this is actually one of the things that when uh, we skunk people find each other at a conference or somewhere, um, we always shake our fists at the sky and say, oh, the great horn owls, it's always about the great horn owls. Um, and so undoubtedly great horn owls eat skunks, undoubtedly. Here's a picture of a great horn owl with the Molina skunk um, in Argentina. So they definitely eat them. But the problem is that skunks, striped skunks in particular, are outside the prey size, the typical prey size for an owl. So great horn owls usually eat things that are around 300 grams. Um, sometimes they'll eat something as big as a kilogram. Um, but skunks are, adult skunks at least, are pretty far outside that range. But then of course there are the baby skunks, right? They're super vulnerable but they can spray. And for owls, the cost of being sprayed by a skunk is actually pretty high. Um, and so when I hear about owls and skunks, it's usually from people that do wildlife rehab and they say, oh, well, every year we get in a dozen owls and they all smell like skunk. Um, and then I say, well, why did they come into the rehab facility? And they say, oh, they're emaciated or they got hit by a car or um, there was something wrong with their vision, okay? So um, this is a, this little um, blurb here is from a note uh, from the Murelet from 1980. Um, and he says that during the period of 1976 to 1978, five great horn owls of unknown sex or age were received by two wildlife rehabilitation centers in California after having had encounters with skunks. All of the birds smelled strongly of skunk and four of them were emaciated. Their eyes had a cloudy appearance and their vision appeared to be impaired possibly indicating the birds have replaced part of, received part of the skunk spray in the face. And so two of these owls eventually died, three were released having recovered. And so, um, you know, that's not bad odds uh, if you're in a wildlife rehab facility, but if you're an owl and you get in the face and you don't get picked up and take it to a rehab facility, you're incapacitated and your chances of survival are quite low. Um, and so, I think that, you know, obviously owls eat skunks from time to time, um, but it's a pretty risky uh, move. And there are probably specialists the same way that other species. So I have a friend who studies mountain lions um, in Teton, and he had one mountain lion that would eat, take skunks, and she kind of specialized on them. Um, but, I, but skunks are not a significant part of um, the regular diet of a great horn owl. Um, and so when I was in grad school, I, I looked through some of the participants uh, on this call and some of you um, know what I was doing in grad school because you were at reserves or otherwise around. Um, but so I was interested in how predators respond to skunks, um, particularly when compared to something that was about the same size. So a fox and the skunk weigh, gray fox and the skunk weigh about the same. Uh, to a predator, they represent about the same size meal, but they're pretty different species, both in terms of the defense that skunks have. Um, but I was particularly interested in um, coloration and I was also interested in body shape. So you know, obviously skunks are black and white, foxes are cryptically colored, they're kind of camouflaged with this gray um, fur. And, but they also have these really distinct um, body types. So skunks are sort of short and fat and they have these little tiny legs and this big plume-like tail. Um, and the foxes are, have these really long legs and a long kind of puffy tail but not that is, they don't hold it in the same way um, that a skunk does. And so I did this totally insane project um, where I made taxidermy mounts of skunks and gray foxes. So I made, and I literally made like a little photo booth. I became so in love with them. Um, so I made a normal colored skunk or <laughs> fox mounts and normal colored skunk mounts. But then I also made um, fox mounts that I colored to look like a skunk. And I made skunk mounts that I colored to look like a fox. Um, and when I say colored to look like, uh, if we have time at the end, I can tell you about the process, but it was quite time intensive um, and pretty convincing. Uh, I had uh, other researchers at other reserves and places stop when they saw this guy in particular. Uh, and people would say, what is that thing? Is it a badger? Is it a squirrel? What is it? Um, so uh, they're pretty exciting. And, and what I did is I put them out with um, infrared video cameras and, and a food bait, and I recorded the behavior of animals that came to visit them. 
because I was interested in whether or not animals, potential predators, were more nervous around skunk colored mounts or skunk shaped mounts or some combination of the two. Um, so this is an example of a video, the sort of video that I would get. So I would identify it to species, so that's a raccoon. This is a gray skunk right here. Um, and I was also curious to see if it paused in its approach, like if it seems a little bit nervous and how long it paused for, whether or not it made contact, and then how long it took to make contact and how long it stayed in contact before taking off. And by and large, animals were super confused by all of this. Um, but I had some pretty interesting, ended up with some pretty interesting videos of mountain lions dragging things away and um, a lot of sort of pseudo attacks from various species. Um, and I found that uh, mammalian carnivores were nervous around black and white animals, but they were also nervous around skunk shaped animals. So they were more uncomfortable around this guy than they were around the gray fox. Um, and it was particularly interesting when you look at it with respect to the relative abundance of skunks at all the sites I visited. So I went to 10 different sites throughout California. There were different numbers of skunks at each site. And basically what I found that is in places where skunks were really common, uh, predators reacted to both the skunk, uh, the skunk shaped and skunk colored mounts really strongly. They avoided them. They were nervous around them. And then places where skunks were rare, um, they got hammered all the time. So they got rolled on, dragged off, licked on, peed on, um, everything. Um, which suggests that there's some element of learning that has to happen with, with predators to understand what that coloration means and to respect it. Um, and so skunk signals take a couple of different forms. So first we have the passive signals. We have that black and white body, the big tail, the whole, um, the whole coloration. Um, and then there's an active signal too. So when they get nervous, the first thing that happens is the tail goes up and then they'll stomp the ground and then they, they will charge forward and then sort of scoot back and rake the ground with their um, front feet. Striped skunks will kind of go into like a partial handstand and spotted skunks actually get into a full handstand, um, which I'll show you shortly. Um, and generally speaking, it works really, really well. So I'm gonna show you some videos um, that are examples. Now, this is obviously not a skunk predator, um, but you can see that tail goes up and then it breaks the ground and then it charges and chases the wily elusive llama away. Um, I love how they walk, it's fantastic. Um, here's a coyote. Um, again, skunk's vision is not particularly good, so it takes them a minute to spot the coyote. Tail goes up, rakes the ground, and then does the charge. So, you know, just to kind of keep in mind, these skunks weigh 10 pounds, 12 pounds. Um, at the absolute most. Um, and a coyote weighs a lot more than that. And so these guys are really pushing off animals that are so much larger than them. After what's happening. And, you know, not bothering the skunk anymore. Or at least it doesn't think it's bothering the skunk anymore. But the skunk is bothered. Um, and it just continues to chase it away. Um, this one's fantastic. So we think about skunks and um, defending themselves by spraying, but this is a skunk that, I don't know if it's, it may feel threatened by this mountain lion, but you can see the mountain lion's head um, is low and it's probably just trying to eat this deer that it's just killed. Um, and you, you can see the skunk displaying at it and mountain lion's like, hey man, I'm just trying to eat here. And then it sprays it. And then suddenly it doesn't have any competition for this fantastic meal. Um, and then this is the handstand of the spotted skunk. Um, this is a little feet out to the side here. Um, and they can actually spray from this position. They just sort of bend their back forward and then they spray over the top of their tail. So essentially, you know, his head is down here at the bottom of the screen and you can see where he's pointing um, and just fold himself kind of in half and spray from that position. Um, and then this is one of my favorites. So this, this right here is a bobcat. Here's a spotted skunk, again, the size of a ground squirrel. Um, 
chasing this bobcat around. And man, these guys just like do not give up. So this is some time later. The bobcat's up here. So the infrared camera creates this sort of bright eye shine. So it's easy to see guys, but see, it's, here it comes again, and it's gonna come this way. And then here it goes again, it's still chasing it. Um, and then this, the quality of this video is terrible. This is from a research project on mountain lions up in Modoc County. Um, and uh, there's an elk carcass right here uh, that you can't see. Um, and so the researchers were watching this and they see their mountain lion sneak back over here and she hangs out for a little while, um, but is not feeding. And so she kind of sits down and relaxes and just kind of stays in this one spot and the researchers couldn't quite figure out what was happening. Um, but if you see, where is it, right here, that's a white tail and a black body of a spotted skunk. So again, 900 grams, it's pushed a mountain lion off its kill and is feeding. And so this happened twice in the same night. So she, you can see she, you can, we don't have audio, but you can see her hiss right here. Um, and uh, this actually got written up as a note in a journal because this is the largest body size differential of any animal that had been recorded to supplant um, another species. So, um, and the reason it works so well is because skunk spray is really terrible. Um, so this is the business end. There's actually, if you look on the internet, you can find a slow-mo version um, of a skunk spraying. I had it in a version of this talk that I gave in the past. It is dramatic and horrifying to many people. Um, so just, if you want to look at it, you should totally do that, uh, but be prepared. Uh, <laughs> it's a very up close shot. Um, so essentially what these guys have is they have two walnut sized glands inside their anus and they have these two sort of nozzles um, that when they're trying to spray the nozzles kind of like peek out and then um, can spray this sort of um, oily uh, goo um, and they can actually control the 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 makeup of the spray so it can be like a stream or it could be kind of an atomized mist um, there's actually a, a, there's a, there's a guy at Humboldt State who did um, the chemistry of striped skunk and spot, he's done a bunch of skunk actually, the chemistry of the spray. And essentially there are seven major volatile components. Um, and there are the, thiols, which um, are the smelly things, and these things called thiol acetates. And so um, uh, Thiols are, it's, it's the, the same class of chemicals that are in sort of an onion when you cut an onion and it makes your eyes water. Um, it's the same type of chemical and it's the same um, class of chemicals that's used to um, put odor in natural gas. So there was an explosion at a school in Texas or something um, and a natural gas explosion. And I think it was like in the 40s. Um, and since that time, they've been adding this odor to um, natural gas because humans can detect it at really, really low concentrations. And so um, this stuff is super, super smelly. Um, it bonds to the protein in your skin, which is why if you get skunk spray on you, it's so difficult to get that smell off. Um, the effect is basically like tear gas. So it causes nausea, vomiting, temporary blindness. Um, if dogs like terriers, like Kate's terrier, um, get sprayed in a burrow, um, they can develop this thing called Heinz body anemia that basically can kill them. Um, it's really, really noxious stuff. Um, and then the thiol acetates um, become thiols. They hydrolyze in water. So you'll notice that if you have a dog that's been sprayed by the skunk, you think you've just about gotten the skunk um, spray smell under control and then that dog gets wet, you'll notice that smell comes right back again. Um, and so this is skunk spray in a vial full of water. So it's actually heavier than water, but it's a really weird consistency. It's very, very thin. It's like the viscosity of like a vinegar or something like that. Like it's really, really thin. Um, and this is just a life hack. If our coronavirus lockdown gets too serious and somebody needs to do surgery, um, there was a paper that was published in 1891 that put forward skunk spray as a potential 
um, anesthetic agent. So uh, it's the title of the article is a new rival of chloroform and ether. And so it says sometime during the summer of 1879, two or three boys secured a two ounce bottle of the perfume from the skunk or pole cat and concluded to play a trick upon one of their schoolmates. Entering his room, they held him and administered the above nauseous fluid in its most concentrated form by inhalation. I could not ascertain what amount had been administered. However, when I reached him, I found the following symptoms. A total unconsciousness, relaxation of the muscular system, extremities cool, pupils natural, breathing normal, pulse 65, temperature 94, in which condition he remained for one hour. So just in case anybody needs to use that information for anything, um, there you have it. Um, and so <laughs> this is when I get into my skunk foibles. Um, like any self-respecting skunk enthusiast, um, I have been spitballing ideas about how I can further investigate um, the essence of the skunk. Um, and so one of the things I was interested in is that there is some anecdotal evidence to suggest that at low concentration, skunk spray, skunk spray is an attractant. So there's, you'll, if you're a fur trapper, um, most commercial trapping moors contain some element of skunk anal glands or skunk spray. Um, but at high concentrations, it's super noxious. And so I got the bright idea um, to see at which concentration skunk spray becomes not becomes an attractant. So I had this whole grand plan to collect skunk spray from road killed skunks um, and then use that and dilute it with glycerin and, and to test like the concentration and at what point it's noxious and what point it's kind of attractive. So I knew when I did this that I was taking shortcuts and I didn't quite realize um, how thoroughly that would come back to haunt me. Um, but I think it's a good cautionary tale, so I'm just gonna share it with you. Um, so this was a female striped skunk. She was hit on Carmel Valley Road right by the reserve. Um, I knew I should be wearing a respirator when I did this. I was too lazy to go home and get it. Um, and so I basically um, squeezed the spray from her anal glands um, into a um, test tube. Um, the reason I should wear respirators, because I've given this talk 70,000 times, and I know that it is akin to tear gas, even if it doesn't come in direct contact with you. Um, so to say that the smell and the taste of skunk spray stuck in my throat for like four or five days is putting it mildly. Like it was in my skin, it was in my hair, it was in my clothes for days. Um, and that's with, I had two pairs of gloves on. I was trying to be really careful. I didn't actually splash any onto myself or anything like that. Um, and so I was a bit bummed that I was <laughs> so lazy and ended up essentially gassing myself with this stuff. Um, but I was really pleased with all of the spray. I mean, this is a ton. I could not believe how much spray was in her glands. Um, and so my next move was to figure out exactly how I was gonna put this out on the landscape. And so I took this vial I wrapped it in three plastic bags and I put it in the fridge, in the lab. Um, this was in, I guess this was in September of last year. Yeah, and the fridge still smells like skunk. Um, so I wrapped it up and it wasn't doing the job. So then I wrapped it in two more plastic bags. I put it in a cooler. I wrapped that cooler in three plastic bags. Um, and that didn't work either. Then I wrapped this plastic bag in two trash bags um, and that didn't work. I mean, the smell was overpowering. It was everywhere. I was apologizing to everybody who was here. I actually took it, the reason it's outside and not in the cooler is because we had a workshop that was here. People were um, looking at lichen, I think, and I thought I'm gonna kill all these people with this skunk spray. Um, and so I finally opened it up. I ordered this special bottle off the internet that I think is for drugs. Like it's supposed to be completely odor free. Um, and so I was all set to like put this vial inside my multiple glass containers. And I thought that's gonna do it. Um, and then I opened the cooler up. And what had happened 
is that the skunk spray had melted its way out of the test tube. So here's the cap of the test tube here. Um, and it had basically become the sticky, skunky, plastic, gooey mess. Um, it was unreal and, and horrifying. Um, and so I contacted the guy who did the skunk chemistry work because I thought, well, this guy, this is a man who knows how to deal with skunk spray. Um, and he basically laughed as politely as one can laugh over email um, and said that I needed to be using um, Teflon lined vials that you use for um, unstable organic solvents. Um, and he told me something I didn't realize, which is that um, skunk spray is a hydrocarbon. So it bonds and sort of becomes one with all other hydrocarbons, i.e. plastic. Um, he said, you can light it on fire and it will burn. Um, and it lets off a delightful sulfury smell when it burns. Uh, so lesson learned uh, on this one for me. I don't think I have, I actually have, um, uh, I collected spray from a spotted skunk with the correct vial. Um, and it's been storing nicely in the freezer. Um, but it doesn't freeze. Uh, and so I don't know, I actually haven't looked up what the uh, freezing point of skunk spray is, but it's colder than whatever that refrigerator or that freezer set up. It's pretty incredible, pretty incredible stuff. Um, and so just kind of as we near the end here, there are just some key things uh, to remember if you encounter a skunk. Um, so one, they don't care about you. They're not afraid of you. They're not gonna run from you. They, they may put their tail up when they see you, but if you don't make a move toward them, they make a wonderful sound also. Um, if you make a move towards them, um, you might be in trouble, but if you leave them alone, um, they're just gonna do their thing. They have terrible eyesight. So, um, you know, this mother skunk has brought her babies right up on this man. He doesn't seem to be particularly concerned about him. Um, skunk spray is energetically costly to produce. So it, it costs them energy to make that stuff and they don't want to run out of it. And so they have this warning display that's super recognizable and it's super predictable. And spraying is a defensive last resort. They do not want to spray if they don't have to. And so as long as you keep that in mind, you can really minimize any negative encounters with skunks. I mean, there's always the odd case where someone walks out the front door and gets sprayed in the face, but um, those cases are really, really few and far between. Um, and so what do we know about these little guys? We know that they have multiple interspecific signals that they use to warn predators that they're dangerous. So they have this color pattern, they do this whole rigmarole with scraping the ground and doing a handstand and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that the predators learn the meaning of this signal from previous encounters, uh, except dogs, because they don't they don't learn anything ever sometimes. I don't know. Um, and then they only spray when they have to. Um, uh, these guys, you know, they, it's, this stuff is really, really precious to them. This is their whole defense. So um, that's why uh, they're really, really careful when they spray and how often they spray. And they're just the best, they're the best animal. So um, with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm also surreptitiously inserting a little Hastings plug here. So um, I know we all love Sedgwick and it's super great and everything, but I think if anybody comes here, you'll realize very quickly that Hastings is in fact the best reserve. Um, <laughs> and we have lots of stuff going on. Um, we're trying to, we've got some speakers that are, are gonna work on a Zoom um, lecture. Um, and then as soon as we're able to, um, we'll open up a little bit more uh, to the public, although that's probably on hold. But in the meantime, um, you can join our mailing list by going to this website, or alternatively, you can pull out your phone and take a picture of this QR code right here, which will take you right to our uh, mail list or mailing list sign-up form, um, or you can email us at hastingsreserve at berkeley.edu. So uh, on that note, I am happy to take any questions that anybody has. All right. Well, it's going to probably take Dennis a minute to um, <laughs> figure out yeah, what I've... he's doing with questions. I just want to tell you guys that in addition to becoming a Zoom PhD candidate, 
I, in the past week, have learned how to scan a QR code. And I just did it in like 20 seconds while we were oh my God. Was putting that plug in. All you have to do is, you're not scanning it. You're basically holding your phone up to it with your camera open. And your, your smartphone figures out what to do with that. So, Jen, I just signed up to be um, on your mailing list. And um, that's awesome. We all want to come up to your reserve now. I know the Sedgwick crowd, the docents would love to come crash your place. So when that is possible, we are going to do it. Excellent. And um, thank you. That was not only informative, but fun and funny. And um, I don't know that we all love skunks quite like you do, but you've con probably converted many of us to change our views a little bit. That's my goal. I like to think of myself as like a skunk cult leader. Like I kind of want to indoctrinate everybody, um, like a skunk evangelist. And plus I, I feel a little bit of residual guilt for all of the skunks that I used, uh, the skunk skins that I used for my research. So I feel like I owe the skunks a debt of gratitude that I try to repay when I can. Well, hey, I, f I figure anybody willing to pull over on the side of the road and uh, pull a, a roadkill skunk off to the side. Like you've kind of yeah. heard that. Um, to... Pro tip, if you find a roadkill skunk that uh, appears not to have sprayed, um, don't put them in your car because <laughs> even though the smell is subtle, it will last for a very long time, so. All right, another pro tip from a former trapper you probably don't advocate trapping skunks off your property, but if you do need to trap a skunk, put your live trap in a, plastic, a black plastic bag. And if you do catch said skunk, then just um, shut the black plastic bag because if they can't see you, they won't spray you. The challenge then comes, you take it somewhere else. And when you go to open your live trap, you need to be able to do it without it seeing you and yeah exposing. it's getting them in the trap is easy getting them out of the trap is <laughs> not well i think you're somewhat of a terrier so um <laughs> <laughs> you haven't maybe learned every lesson you're gonna learn but i sure learned a lot so um thank you for sharing your love and knowledge of of skunks and dennis i'm going to turn it over to you Okay, okay. Is my is my audio there. active? Yep. You're it's all okay. you. Thank you. Uh and I there's a bunch of questions coming in, Jen, and a lot of superlatives. We'll skip the superlatives and stick with the questions, okay? Uh here's one. Okay. And I think you've answered it toward the end, but John asks, when do they release their scent? Is it only when they're stressed? Or is there any other occasion? Um, like all carnivores, um, skunks do use scent um, as a um, like in, intraspecific communication. So they'll use just the way that most carnivores will um, use urine and things like that. Like they will use a little bit of that um, in marking. Um, and they just kind of have this sort of wafting. I mean, I don't, I'm not a huge Pepe Le Pew fan in general. <laughs> Um, but the sort of the visual of Pepe Le Pew kind of walking around in this sort of cloud of sort of faint skunkiness happening around him, like that's kind of how they exist in the world. Um, they don't spray each other, so they'll get into fights and stuff the way that other animals will when they come together, um, particularly like two males coming together, although they're not particularly territorial. Um, but they don't spray each other. Um, it's a bridge too far. Um, but for the most part, yeah, when they when they're ready to spray and they're going to do it, they really only do it in a defensive um, posture. And, and on that subject, do they let the full amount go, or do, are they gingerly putting out a, um, a portion can, of their amount? They can spray. They can spray. 10, 11 times before they need to refuel. Um, so their bodies are constantly producing this stuff. Um, and I think the amount that they spray, they can definitely control how they spray and the amount that they, they spray. Um, and so that, that kind of depends on the predator that's attacking them and kind of the nature of the, the, um, the attack. 
uh, they can, like I said, they can spray in kind of an atomized mist, they can spray in a stream. If the winds are to their favor, they can spray up to 30 feet. Um, they can spray 10, 12, 15 feet with great regularity and great accuracy. Um, so, and spotted skunks, when they are in that handstand, they'll bend their back however far they need to to spray the, in, the, in an animal's face. So if they're being attacked by a coyote, they'll be kind of turned up a little bit so they can spray in its face versus something smaller where they'll kind of aim closer to the ground. And Katrina asks, how long would it take a skunk to recharge after spraying? Um, if they get down to nothing, you're looking at a day, day and a half. Um, but it's pretty uncommon, I would imagine. I mean, I guess nobody's, well, actually, that's probably not true. I bet people have studied this. Um, uh, it's pretty uncommon in a natural setting. I mean, people like to take animals into captivity and harass them and make them do things that um, don't necessarily uh, reflect what would happen between like natural predator prey um, uh, interactions. But uh, I, I can imagine it would be pretty uncommon for a skunk to have completely exhausted its spray amount in one interaction. Um, and so I would imagine that in the life of a skunk, there would be very few days where they were sort of unarmed, as it were. Uh, Sally mentions that in urban areas, some, uh, you know, residential areas, they use rodent poison. And she worries and wonders whether or not the rodent poison would attract a skunk. Would it, Definitely. Would a skunk be tempted to ingest rodent poison? Yeah, so they, they flavor, for most bait block type um, uh, rodent control um, poisons, they're sweet because they want the rodents to eat them. And so it also attracts a whole slew of animals um, that aren't target animals. So skunks, definitely. Raccoons, definitely. Foxes, definitely. Dogs and cats, definitely. Um, that stuff's pretty noxious. Um, and I would discourage people highly from using that stuff under any circumstances. The impacts of rodenticides like that on the wildlife is immeasurable um, because you have like a mouth. So essentially what that stuff does is it's like a, a blood thinner. And so these animals will eat it and then they basically sort of bleed to death from the inside. And so unless they die in a burrow, those animals are going to be available to coyotes and foxes and bobcats and all of these sort of natural predators. Then those animals ingest that rodent and then they die and it just kind of works its way through the food chain so that stuff is really really awful gotcha so nico asks uh, why is his dog black and white it's an excellent question <laughs> uh <laughs> sorry i had that's, to ask, that's ask kate <laughs> yeah okay over to you kate um <laughs> What since tomato juice doesn't well, work? Louie's black and white because I had a few minutes to kill earlier. But um, <laughs> Nico had a real question to ask, and that is about how you learn to do the uh, skin prep. Oh, it's difficult. So what is um, the so um, yeah. I bought the skins tanned already, so I didn't have to do that part. Although I'm experimenting with that stuff now. Um, I'm gonna. I've got a spotted skunk that I'm gonna try to mount as soon as I can find the right sort of model for it. Um, it's actually the spotted skunk that I have as a male and I got, he was hit on the road in September. And if you will harken back to earlier in the slides, uh, his testicles are enormous. And the only spotted skunk models I can find are them doing the handstand. Um, and I don't wanna take the skunk with these enormous testicles to like, an elementary school and have somebody ask what are those things so it's a personal problem that i'm working on right now but um with the other skunks um so uh, i use obviously regular skunk skins and regular fox skins um for the normal colored mounts and then for the reciprocal colored mounts um so i dyed the fox or i'm sorry the skunk fur tried to bleach it as best i can anybody who has dark hair knows that you can only try to bleach your hair so much before it becomes orange, which luckily is sort of like the undercoat color of a gray fox. So that worked out fine. Um, and so then I cut out the back of the skunk skin and then traced it onto a fox skin and then sewed that fox skin into the, the skunk. And so that skunk colored 
no, the fox colored skunk um, is actually has fox fur on its head and then its back. That's all actual fox fur. And then the rest is skunk that I dyed. Um, so each one of those to make is like, my God, like a 14 hour process. Uh, and so when I would have animals walk off with them, uh, it was horrifying. Uh, and I only lost one of those guys uh, to a coyote. Um, I learned very quickly that I needed to anchor my mounts to the ground. Uh, unfortunately, that guy got away. Um, and then the black and white uh, foxes, uh, I dyed with hair dye. Um, but hair dye leaves this kind of residual fresh smell behind, which I didn't want. And so it was a process of um, using detergents to strip the oils and stuff out of the hair dye, and then also using charcoal to kind of deaden the, the sort of hair dye smell. Um, it was hard to get the white parts white. That took a very long time. Um, but again, it was just like a massive time sink to do that stuff. Uh, it's so much of a time sink, sink that I did this project in 2005, 2006, 2007. And these things are in the barn here now because I refuse to get rid of them because you never know when you need a fox that's colored like a skunk. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the lifespan of wild skunks is pretty short. Uh, what about in captivity, Mark? Would like to know whether you have any data. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, in, in so there's this whole like skunk pet world that I haven't really delved into, but I've heard that the skunks live 10, 11 years um, if they're pets, um, which I would imagine like in a zoo is kind of the same, would be kind of the same deal. Um, huh. Yeah, like I said, disease is kind of the thing that gets them. So if they can be inoculated against um, some of the more prevalent diseases, then, then they can survive quite a long time. Can you have a pet skunk without surgically removing the... Um, you can. Actually, there's a lot of stories of like pioneers and stuff that would, you know, they would be living out in the middle of nowhere. And then all of a sudden there's a skunk that's living um, under their house. And then suddenly the skunk's living in their house with them. And as long as you don't surprise them, uh, you don't want to knock a chair over. Um, and they're, you know, they're perfectly happy to just live alongside people. Like they're just, they just don't get bothered about stuff. They don't really care, you know? And so when you see skunks and stuff that have been hit on the road, it's not because they're, they ran into the, a car. It's because they didn't move when a car was coming because they never have to move when something's coming their way. Um, so if you've ever been behind a skunk on a road or, uh, something like that, you know that you are, go the pace that the skunk goes and they can't be bothered uh, with your presence at all. So they're completely capable of living alongside people with their anal glands intact um, as long as there's not, as long as you don't drop a dish or uh, slam a door. <laughs> so speaking of roadkill, I'd like to repeat a question I asked last time and that was, do vultures eat dead skunks or or is it the last thing they choose to eat and kind of eat it with long teeth if they really have? You know, they do. Lots of animals eat skunks and they'll scavenge skunks. Um, particularly, uh, you know, there's that whole, um, uh, the skunk spray at low concentration being an attractant. So sometimes you'll see a skunk on the road that's been hit. And then the next couple of nights, you'll notice uh, an opossum's been hit or a raccoon's been hit. It's because they're coming into the smell of this skunk that's on the road. Um, vultures do locate their prey by smell. Um, so you would think that they might not be into it, but they are. So I don't think they're particularly discerning. Um, yeah, they will happily eat, uh, eat roadkill skunk. Jen, could you speak to, to why you can smell a skunk in your yard even After though it hasn't sprayed yet, are, are mustelids just stinky? They are stinky in general, although they're not mustelids. They're mephitids, Kate. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, why? Why are they so smelly without? I don't know. I mean, it could be. It could be all part of the defense. It could be okay. that, you know, why not advertise your presence? Um, Olfact in an olfactory way, um, if you can. Um, so some of these signals, a lot of these signals become stronger when they're what's called multimodal. So if you have a coloration, that's one thing, but a coloration plus a sound plus a smell, it's sort of like greater than the sum of its parts. And so um, 
you know, that could very well be part of it. I don't know. I mean, I certainly know that when you could tell when a skunk's been in the yard and there's no sign of a skunk anywhere near. Um, so I'm not sure. A lot of skunk stories in the chat also, but, but Craig asks if tomato juice doesn't work on the dog, what does? Oh, um, if you Google a uh, skunk spray treatment, um, there's the same guy that did all the chemistry work around the, the components in skunk spray also sort of came up with an antidote. Um, and it involves baking soda, baking soda, but baking soda, hydrogen peroxide, um, dish soap, I want to say something else. Maybe it's just those three things. Uh, but that you can find the um, various formulas online. And essentially what it does is it sort of breaks down uh, the bonds between the sulfur um, and the hydrogen. And so it kind of eliminates that sulfury smell. It works pretty well. I mean, I might, I've used it on my dog and it seems to work. I mean, it doesn't, it's not a 100% fix, but it, it, it works pretty well. Elaine asks, and claims that their skunk comes by and marks her porch on a regular basis. Is there anything she can do to repel uh, the skunk from doing this? Um, possibly. Um, so they don't like the smell of ammonia. So if it's if it's an enclosed area or it can be an area where um, maybe like right where the skunk is marking, if you put ammonia in a bucket or even like a yogurt container or something and punch some holes in it. Um, that smell of ammonia is really, really noxious to a lot of animals, um, and that's typically kind of the best way. If they, if they can't be physically excluded, um, then that, that's worth a shot. Mark asks whether or not Santa Cruz Island spotted skunks are an isolated subspecies. They are an isolated subspecies. Um, and they're, uh, they, you know, spotted skunks tend to do well on these sort of islands. Um, they don't do well where there are a lot of predators. Um, and uh, there are potentially a couple explanations for that. But, but yes, the Santa Cruz Island spotted skunk is a subspecies of a spotted skunk. Um, and uh, they're studied pretty extensively. Uh, and so there's a lot of information out there about those guys. Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm just looking. Jared, are, are you able to continue doing skunk research in addition to all the I'll be the, the um, I'd love to. I mean, I'm definitely, it's always in the back of my mind what I can do. Um, I, I really like the little guys. Um, and partially that comes from working with um, all of like the big critters. So like I worked with cheetahs and I worked with dolphins and I worked with lemurs. And it's a pretty intense scene, mountain lions around those species. Uh, and so we don't know very much about meso predators and they're so interesting. And they live in these sort of, this nether world between, you know, all of these bigger predators and they gotta find enough to eat. And it's like, how do you avoid all of these species that could hurt you? Um, so I would love to do more with skunks. I have my whole little skunk scent game plan, which is still a thing. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how to do something with weasels, I think would be amazing. Um, and so that's kind of my next move, I think, if I get. Do you need, in, in addition to some money to probably hire some techs and get equipment, do you need the same permits that you would need to trap a mountain lion to trap a spotted skunk? Yeah, you just need a scientific collection permit for all of those guys. Are there any permits or restrictions about, uh, I mean, having a pet skunk? Um, you know, I don't know. A lot of states, I believe California is one of them, prohibit you from owning native wildlife as a pet. Um, but like I said, there's this huge pet skunk community. Um, which I haven't had any interest to investigate. Um, but uh, they're cool in a couple of ways, actually. The sort of domestic skunks, you'll, if you, if anybody investigates this pet skunk business, I've heard they make terrific pets, by the way, although you shouldn't have one. Um, uh, the coloration, like, so uh, I think the color pattern breaks down pretty quickly. So the selection on the exact pattern of the skunks that I showed um is very very strong and so when you get when you have skunks that aren't under predation pressure um then the black and white coloration kind of starts to break apart a little bit and it doesn't they don't become not black and white but this the sort of those two thin 
lines down the back and then the line down the forehead like that be, that can become kind of a mottled color they can become more white they can become more black um so i don't know if if the pet skunk people breed them for specific color patterns i mean i'm sure they do on to some degree but it would be interesting to see how quickly that color pattern breaks down once the skunk goes into captivity once a you know generationally once skunks are taken into captivity well hey i, I feel like we've exhausted you jen and, Susan has um, a lot of roadkill. Oh. Well, I just maybe ask a couple more questions, Dennis. And there's so many questions coming in. I, I don't feel like we can accommodate them past eight thirty. In fact, our webinar. It's your call. I'm fine. I can go forever. I, this is literally my favorite thing to talk about. So, <laughs> are um, you nocturnal? Okay, are you right. just coming to life? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, well, Susan and others have noticed that during certain times of the year, there's a lot more skunk roadkill out there. And can you explain that in terms of their annual cycle? Perhaps? Yeah, so that's usually um, winter. So that's like February, March. You'll see them late January, February, March. That's the breeding season. So they're all moving around trying to find mates. Um, and so you'll see a big spike in roadkill skunks. Um, February is the big month here where we see them all the time. Cool. Um, I'm scrolling, Kate. Uh, da, 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 da. So there's the spotted skunks are obviously very less common than striped skunks. Any yeah. particular reason for it? I don't know. Um, nobody really knows. So uh, you'd be shocked to learn that people don't often monitor skunk populations. Um, <laughs> and uh, so much of what we know about historical numbers of spotted skunks come from trapping records. Um, and so, um, I mean, we, there were densities reported from the 40s of like 12 spotted skunks a square kilometer. And I'm sure that's patchy, you know, with good habitat and things like that. Um, but I think you would be hard pressed today. So the spotted skunk that was hit on the road here that I have in our freezer here, I had people who have lived in this area for 20 years who have never seen one before. Um, and I don't know what, what's, what's happened to the population. So there was a paper written in 2005-ish about the decline of the Eastern spotted skunk that's also kind of populations have kind of crashed everywhere. And because there are these little guys that nobody really cares about, it's all been sort of under the radar. Um, it could be that there was a disease outbreak that wiped, out, wiped them out. Um, so, so the work that I did looking at the density of, so the reaction of predators um, according to the density of skunks, so places where skunks were common, predators knew what they were, recognized them, avoided them, places where skunks were rare, they got chewed on, they got licked, they got dragged around, all that kind of stuff. If there's some component of learning that has to happen in order for a predator to know that a skunk is noxious, then it's, it would be very hard if there was a disease outbreak or something that knocked um, the spotted skunk population below sort of the threshold density for predators to learn, um, it would be hard for those guys to recover um, because they're so small. So if you're a spotted skunk and you get attacked by a bobcat or like that dog in that video, one bite isn't going to kill you and you can spray and lessons have been learned. If you're a spotted skunk and you're that big, um, you're much less likely to survive that initial attack and be able to spray. Um, and so that could be part of it too. Uh, we really don't know. Um, so it's kind of a mystery and it's a bummer. Any truth to the, I guess, rumor at this point that skunks have a resistance to rattlesnake venoms? Oh, I've never heard that before. Here it is. So that's a new one, Stuart. I, so you don't know that rattlesnakes might be a, that doesn't likely that rattlesnakes might be it. Well, maybe the little guy. Rattlesnakes can, can eat a ground squirrel. So mm -hmm. uh, spotted skunk mm, possibly could be. Yeah, right? could uh, be. But these guys are so these guys are predators too. So they're they're not. Um, they're more able to defend themselves with biting and stuff too um, than a ground squirrel might be able to. But it's undoubtedly, rattlesnakes take skunks from time to time. Little skunks for sure. Uh -huh. Unless they're immune to the venom, which maybe they are. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just scrolling. I think I'm reaching toward the end, Kate, but help me out if you can. Yeah, tomato juice. Someone just raised their hand, and now I can't, I can't figure out who it was. So if maybe they should ask chat again then. Uh, 
there's lots of thanks here, Jen. You can, I think you can look at it later. But this is recorded. So, Kate, do you know how people can access the recording if they? I don't. I'm going to have to research this, but I know I have the recording, and my goal would be to convert it to a YouTube video and post a link on our website. Um, but I haven't done that before, so I'll have to figure that out. But I know we'll have the MP4 and we'll have a chat log and we can make that available to participants, but it's really people that aren't here tonight that <laughs> want to see that, so. Carol, I'm sorry, Carol asked, if you give a skunk a bath, will it smell better? Definitely. Uh, oh, for a minute. <laughs> but would you, would you do it? Uh -huh. No, probably not. Although they swim, so maybe they'd be into it. Right. And Scott asks whether or not the models that you use was their, was their um, appearance in terms of handstands or not handstands with, did you document how? So I was really careful. Like so I, because I use spotted skunks, uh, or I'm sorry, striped skunks, um, their first, their first move when they're feeling threatened is to put their tail up. So I was careful to position all the models in a way that the tail was just kind of arched behind them and not a, like a defensive type posture. Um, uh, and so I, hopefully that, you know, the posture wasn't, didn't determine sort of the behavior of animals as they approach them. I would try to be as careful as possible about making sure that they all looked as similar and smelled as similar as possible. Hey, this is an aside, but there, there's a show on PBS called Spies in the Wild. I don't know if you've seen it, but they have, Somebody's made over 30 different wildlife species that have, that look so realistic, but they have a camera embedded in them and they're, they're um, robotic so they can control like tortoises walking and mm -hmm. I think that could be your next jam. No, you know what my next jam is, is to, so you know, I don't, well, maybe you don't know, but they have this rattlesnake training that you can do for dogs. Um, I know I my dog needs it. Yeah, well, I want to do a skunk training for dogs. Oh. That's right. Um, because that's I, idea. I, I, uh, a, that's how we Hastings makes it through the <laughs> coronavirus. Um, and uh, <laughs> B, uh, I think that there may be some differences in dog breed and how they respond to skunks. Okay. So some dogs are bred to to hunt by sight. Some are bred to hunt by smell. And it might be kind of cool to see if there's if the ability of these these different dog breeds to learn about skunks differs according to what they're sort of. It makes perfect sense. If you can teach a dog to smell what a rattlesnake smells like and to avoid it before it rattles or bites you, mm -hmm. then you can learn to stay far enough away from a skunk that it won't spray you. Yeah, in That's theory. Brilliant. So I just need a robot skunk. I have investigated. I've emailed a number of people, none of whom have responded uh, to my requests for them to make me a robot skunk. So I'm thinking about it. So a wild animal certainly can learn the harm if he gets sprayed. Mm -hmm. But does somehow the wild animal able to pass that knowledge on to either its offspring or other um, wild? Probably not for most of these guys, only because uh, I, well, I don't know, actually, it's possible. Um, so before, uh, so the project that I did was one of the very few projects to look at um, how warning coloration affects natural predators in the wild. So most of the work that's been done on aposematism has been done in a lab environment with animals that either haven't been exposed to these particular species or um, they're not, they wouldn't be found in the same place, that kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, and so most of what we know, well, so a lot of those studies concluded that uh, that predator species must have an innate bias against eating prey that's contrastingly colored. So if you give a bluebird that's never eaten anything except mealworms and sunflower seeds, if you give them um, some food item that's colored with black and white stripes, uh, the idea is that they just, they won't eat it because they don't like things that are contrastingly colored. Um, because Otherwise, the initial evolution of these species that have this warning coloration is problematic because if you're a spotted skunk and you're too small to defend yourself from most of your predators and you don't survive long enough to spray them, then there's no, then the first 
mutation. So the first spotted skunk that's black and white that shows up on Earth is going to just get hammered because that black and whiteness makes them easy to see. It makes them easy to differentiate from their surroundings, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so this whole innate bias idea was kind of the, the way that evolutionary biologists explained how warning coloration initially involved, evolved. Um, the work that I did did show that there's a learning component. So if that's the case, then it's certainly possible that, um, you know, a, a coyote can teach their offspring to avoid skunks to some degree. Um, but uh, a lot of that, I think, is probably experiential learning. But it's certainly possible. Their cultural transmission of information through generations is super well documented in lots of different species. I don't know for sure, though. I feel like I feel like we maybe almost stumped you on that one. One more. <laughs> one I, more. Dennis, I don't know if you're going to ask the the question that I'm going to trump you on, but um, you know, a lot of people struggle with skunks because they dig up gardens, mm -hmm. and I know there's a benefit to the garden by what they're doing, but it's still really problematic for people who have nice gardens. So, sure. what are they doing and is there any tr trying to stop skunks? They're digging for grubs and all kinds of little larval invertebrates that are living under the soil. Um, and there's not much to be done about it unless you do something like put landscape cloth or something like that, or not landscape cloth, um, uh, hardware cloth, like that mesh stuff down. Could you make an argument that what they're digging up are harmful to your garden? And if Oh, for sure. Yeah, a lot of the insects that they're digging up would eventually be harmful. Um, but they also eat like tubers and bulbs and things like that, <laughs> um, which maybe aren't as harmful. Uh, yeah, there's not a ton you can do about it. I mean, it's like gophers are good for aerating the soil, but no one's jazzed to see a gopher turn up in the garden. All right, Dennis, do you have a last question? And then we'll. Well, Scott, Scott says if you pick a skunk up by its tail, that's stops him from spraying right that's what i've heard uh mm -hmm. i'm not i wouldn't bet on it though <laughs> so uh i think that might be one of those uh, uh great horn owl urban legend things well jen i can't thank you enough for setting aside another thursday night to educate <laughs> us about skunks and i really do hope you guys can you and your family can make it down to sedgwick we'd love to show you around and talk skunks some more <laughs> excellent all right so okay. um the last slide has contact information if people want to follow up i i would guess jen would accept uh, questions via oh email for sure yeah if anybody's got a question we didn't get to definitely send us an email i've been giving out your email address right and left privately so perfect <laughs> and get get on that training it's a great idea yeah i know it is i just gotta just got to fund it. You just got to round up with me a $40,000 skunk robot. <laughs> no, use it? live skunks. They use live rattlesnakes. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe I, maybe I just do live skunks. That'd be easier. With plugs or something. Well, I mean, maybe it works better if they do what they got to do, you know? Right. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, right. for Zooming in tonight. And um, join us again next month. No problem. We're going to keep doing this till we get to see everybody again in person. So we, we had about 220 at, at the high point, Kate. Excellent. Right. Very good. Well, thank you, Janet. Your internet was awesome. It turned out to be Dennis's internet that was problematic tonight. Uh, <laughs> it's the first time ever for me. All right. And hey, Dennis uh, is going to do a Corvid talk on the July 2nd. To, to Tuesday, uh, I think. Uh, I, gee, I guess I ought to know, huh? No, I think we traditionally have these things on Thursday. Let me double check. <laughs> we are so good Thursday, at plugging our Zoom series. Thursday, July 2nd, uh, we'll be back on a Zoom lecture on Corvids, not COVID. Corvid. So. And Jen, if you'd like the uh, URL to that for your mailing list, um, we're happy to send it on. Excellent. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Good night, everybody. Right. Thank, thank you again. Thank you. Adios.